welcome to the topic of disorders of the hemostasis so we have seen how the normal hemostasis will take place let us have a look on the three important and small topics thrombosis that is formation of a thrombus at any time this thrombus can detach from the site of its origin it can become an embolus an embolus can obstruct the blood supply to the various organs it can become an infarction so it can lead to the infarction of the organ so let us have a look what are the causes for thrombus formation what we call it as virtuous triad and what are the various types of an embolus and what are the types of infarcts red infarcts and white infarcts so let us have a look on this so virtuous triad of thrombus formation consists of three things endothelial cell injury the stasis of a blood or it could be turbulence of a blood hypercoagulation of the blood what are the causes for endothelial cell injury most important and common causes are hypertension the endotoxins the scarred valves that what happens with the rheumatic heart disease and various other uh, valve disorders hyperhomocysteinemia hypercholesterolemia smoking and even radiation all these things can cause loss of endothelium that exposes the subendothelial collagen which is highly thrombogenic any endothelial cell injury causes the formation of a thrombus alteration in the blood flow either it could be turbulence or it could be stasis turbulence results in the formation of arterial thrombus whereas stasis of a blood it results in the venous thrombus so alteration in blood flow causes disruption in the laminar blood flow it causes concentration of more and more clotting factors permit the build of the thrombus formation at that particular area and also promote the endothelial cell activations once the endothelial cells are get activated they are able to liberate so many procoagulants and anticoagulants as you know it already various causes for hypercoagulability status of a blood most commonly it is primary or genetic where inherited mutations can be there like factor 5 laden mutations prothrombin mutations antithrombin 3 deficiencies and deficiency as of protein c and protein s acquired causes are more common actually than the primary causes for example patient who is on prolonged bed rest after say rotrophic accidents that immobilization itself predisposes for hypercoagulability status patient who has undergone myocardial infarction so he is also again prone for hypercoagulability status prolonged surgeries fracture who fact person who has suffered from fractures especially of long bones person suffered from high percentage of burns patient with the procoagulant uh, activities are commonly seen with the cancer patients say patient with the mucin secreting adenocarcinomas a lot of procoagulants will be secreted and that will causes the hypercoagulability status of a blood patient who has undergone cardiac valve implantation again very prone for hypercoagulability status dic and even sle patients are prone for hypercoagulability status hyperhistogenic status certain ovarian tumors like granulosa cell tumor makes the person in a hypercoagulability status smoking habit sickle cell anemia patient and even nephrotic syndrome patients so these are the variety of causes where acquired causes where you see the hypercoagulability of the blood remember stasis of blood also results in uh, formation of a thrombus within the chambers of a heart such a thrombus is called as mural thrombus mural thrombus is the one which is formed within the heart or within the vessels if it is formed within the right side of a heart it results in migration of such a thrombus into the pulmonary vessels if it is formed on the left side of a heart then it will migrate in the aorta and it can become systemic embolus so such a thrombus which are formed within the cardiac chambers are called as mural thrombus they are very common after the uh, episode of myocardial infarction deep venous thromboses are very common in a person who are standing for a long time say bus conductors and such a persons will develop a thrombosis so called as deep venous thrombosis very common in the left leg but 50% of them remain asymptomatic or suddenly they can manifest with a dislodgement of that embolus and it can become a saddle embolus and which will obstruct the main bifurcation of the pulmonary vessels and that can cause sudden death one of the peculiar syndromes so called as trussi syndrome 
which is due to the tumor associated procoagulant release very commonly seen with the carcinoma of the pancreas or any mesen secreting adeno carcinomas mesen secreting adeno carcinoma of the stomach breast prostate lung even osteosarcomas can cause the trosse syndrome here there is increased risk of thromboembolic phenomena due to the dissemination of the cancers so such a episode is also called as migratory thrombophlebitis one of the important leukemia aml m3 that is acute promyelocytic leukemia is known for dic's such a thing is known as migratory thrombophlebitis once the thrombosis is formed it will have one of these fate what are the fate of thrombus it can propagate from the site of its origin it can become an embolus sometimes it can be totally get dissolved due to the fibrinolytic activity of the blood sometimes there can be recanalization of the thrombus that is formed within the vessel sometimes there can be organization of the thrombus within the blood vessels so remember a mnemonic pedro propagation embolization dissolution of a thrombus recanalization of a thrombus and organization of a thrombus so this how the organized thrombus will appear under light microscopy so here is the thrombus here is the blood vessel it should show firm attachment to the endothelial cell lining then only you should call it as thrombus if there is no attachment to the endothelial cell lining then it is a post mortem clot let us have a look what is an embolus and what are the types of embolism definition of embolism is goes like this it is a detachment of intravascular mass either it could be solid or it could be liquid or it could be gaseous mass carried by the blood to the distant site away from its site of origin so it's a initially it will be a thrombus if it goes to the distant area then we call it as an embolus 99% of them are thromboembolism that means it is a thrombus gets dislodged from the sites of its origin and it becomes an embolus so consequence of embolus is ischemic necrosis of the affected tissue that means it obstruct the blood supply to the particular organ and the consequences depends on which organ is get affected various types of embolism venous embolism or pulmonary embolism very commonly due to the deep venous thrombosis these are seen in a person who are long standing in their occupation arterial thrombus mural thrombi very commonly seen after the myocardial infarction paradoxical embolism or the one where venous embolism will become an arterial especially in a patient who is having asd atrial septal defect or ventricular septal defect so these embolus initially they are venous embolism they can become an arterial due to the defect in the heart valves fat embolism is very common after the fracture of the long bones especially fracture of uh, femur or fracture of a pelvic bones so such a person who is having a fat embolism they will usually manifest with the presence of petechial rashes in the post operative period so any patient who is having a fracture of long bones or a pelvic bones you should keep an eye on their skin manifestation of this fat embolism you will see petechial rashes you should suspect the fat embolism it is very difficult to demonstrate this fat embolism in the autopsy cases you have to use the frozen section cryostat sections and you have to use the special stain for fat that is sudan black and isle red wolf unless you use that it is very difficult to demonstrate the fat embolism in the lung parenchyma mass amniotic fluid embolism is rare but grave complication due to the uh, handling during the delivery period so amniotic fluid can escape and it can enter into the blood vessels and it can form an embolus air embolism either it could be due to the improper uh, infusion of the iv fluids or it could be due to the some other causes so air embolism again is a grave complication so they say that 100 ml of air is enough to kill a person septic embolism and foreign body embolism are very rare as such and they are the two different types of uh, embolism again so let us have a look on pulmonary embolism remember it is very commonly from deep venous thrombosis deep venous thrombosis in a person who is uh, on long standing duration that predisposes stasis of a blood in the leg veins such a uh, embolus they can dislodge from that particular site and they can obstruct the main pulmonary arteries 
the bifurcation of the pulmonary arteries. So such a embolus is occurred as saddle embolus. Once a pulmonary embolism occurs, such a person are very much prone for development of recurrent embolic episodes. Multiple emboli are sure of small emboli in the small pulmonary arteries are very very common in person with this pulmonary embolism. Systemic thromboembolism, they are very commonly arises from the intracardiac mural thrombi. Left ventricular wall infarction is the most common cause for this systemic thromboembolism. Patient who is having mitral stenosis, again very prone for development of these types of systemic thromboembolism. So these arterial thrombi, they will migrate to the different sites of the body. So they can affect anywhere in the body. They can go to the lower limbs and they can cause gangrene of the lower limbs. They can go to the brain and they can cause stroke like episode and infarction of the brain. They can go to the intestinal mesenteric vessels and they can cause ischemic bowel disease. They can go to the kidney and cause kid renal infarction and they go to the spleen and cause splenic infarction. Fat embolism is quite rare and microscopic demonstration of fat embolism is the diagnostic point. Usually they occur 1 to 3 days after the injury. Pulmonary insufficiency will develop in these patients. The patients will develop tachypnea, dyspnea, tachycardia, especially in the post-operative period after the long bone fractures. Sometimes they also develop a neurogenic symptoms like irritability, restlessness, delirium and a coma. Low platelets results in development of the petechial skin rashes. So any patient who is having uh, long bone fractures, you should look for these neurogenic uh, signs and symptoms as well as skin rashes. So if they develop, that indicates that person is having a fat embolism. And these can prove uh, very fatal in 10% of the individual cases. So remember, what are the important causes for fat embolism? Mainly it is the fracture of the lung bones. Not only that, soft tissue trauma, burns, Parental lipid infusion can cause fat embolism, sickle cell crisis, acute pancreatitis, liposuction and even decompression sickness can be a cause for the fat embolism. Air embolism is quite rare, that is presence of a gas bubbles in the circulation. So 100 ml of air is needed to produce the clinical effect. Chest wall injuries, neck injuries, sometimes really it could be therapeutic or intraoperative. So all these things can prove lethal. Decompression sickness that is seen with us deep sea drivers is again an example of the air embolism. Amniotic fluid embolism is quite rare but very grave complication of the pregnancy. It results mainly due to the ruptured uterine veins. It is important obstetric complication. So patient will manifest with a sudden onset of severe dyspnea, cyanosis, hypotension, shock, seizures and even coma. If at all patient survives, they are very much prone for development of the pulmonary edema as well as repeated uh, episodes of DIC. So with that few types of uh, embolism, let us see the two types of infarction that is mainly the red infarct and white infarct. So what is an infarct? Infarct is the area of ischemic necrosis due to the occlusion of the arterial blood supply or due to the impaired venous drainage. Most commonly it is due to the thrombus or it could be also due to the embolus. Rarely it is due to the vasospasm or atheromatous occlusion of the vessels or sometimes due to the external uh, tumors that will compress the blood vessels. Venous, impaired venous drainage results in the congestion of the organs. So depending on the color, we classify them as red infarct or a hemorrhagic infarcts. If they are anemic, they are called as white infarcts. So red infarcts are mainly seen in the organs with a dual blood supply like lung and small intestine and organs which are loose like in lung we see again the red infarcts. So very commonly they ask in MCQs which of the following organs will show red infarcts, which of the following organs will show white infarcts. So you should remember that red infarcts are seen in organ with a dual blood supply like lung will have a dual blood supply, bronchial arteries as well as pulmonary arteries. Loose organs like lung again and with a venous occlusion like ovarian torsion again it results in the red infarct and previously congested the tissues also shows the red infarction. Organs with a single arterial end blood supply for example heart is having only one blood supply that is coronary arteries there is no other alternate blood supply so these arteries are the one which will supply the blood to the heart. Spleen is having one only one arterial supply that is splenic artery. 
kidney is having only one arterial blood supply that is renal artery so any occlusion in the blood supply to these organs results in the white infarcts so heart spleen kidney and brain what you will see is the white infarct and microscopically what you will see is the coagulative necrosis in heart spleen and kidney and you will see liquefactive necrosis in the brain so that is the types of two types of infarcts white infarcts and the red infarcts thank you